right, folks, um, two weeks ago, we had a look at God's love for us. And we saw that John 3.16, which is the most well-known Bible verse, the most quoted verse in the Bible, has been called the gospel in a nutshell. And that's the verse where Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves the world. And we saw that we are told by Paul that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The only thing that can keep you from Christ's love is you yourself. Nothing external can. He says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or terrible things. He said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God is so high, you can't get over it, so wide, you can't get around it. Nothing can separate us. And then we saw that even though there's some who try to teach a limited atonement, that the Bible makes it clear that Jesus died for the whole world. Cosmos is the term that's used of the unregenerate, sinful world. And it's for that world that John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the whole world, the universal world. 1 John 2 verse 2 says, he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's Christians. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we believe in an unlimited atonement. The atonement was for all. There are some who don't avail themselves of the benefits of the atonement because they don't exercise faith in Jesus. But it's not because their sins were not paid for. And so we saw that God loves sinners. He doesn't rejoice when sinners die in an unrepentant state, although he's a just God and he will punish sin. It's something he takes no pleasure in. And he says in Ezekiel 33 verse 11, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Sometimes we derive some sort of pleasure in the fact that ungodly people will be punished. But God says, even though it's a certainty, it's not something that is pleasing to him. And in fact, we see this attitude in Jonah. Jonah was angry when God, um, you know, accepted the repentance of the Ninevites. He wanted God to punish the Ninevites. He knew that God would willingly forgive them if they repented. And that's why he deliberately doesn't want to go and tries to run away from God because he knows that God will forgive them. And he actually becomes angry at God when eventually God drags him there, so to speak, kicking and screaming. And he preaches this reluctant prophet, and he pronounces judgment on the city. And we see that the king of the city calls for, you know, repentance in sackcloth and ashes. He calls for a fast. And rather than rejoicing that these wicked people have repented, this is reading from the New Living Translation. It's more a paraphrase than a translation, although they call themselves a translation, but I like the way they render it, yeah? This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? I told you so. You were going to forgive them. That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. Just kill me now. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. What did he predict? The destruction of the city. He says, well, if that's not going to happen, I'd rather be dead. He was looking forward to seeing Nineveh destroyed because they were the hated enemies of the Israelites, rightfully so, very cruel people. And he was looking forward to God judging them. And he says, well, if it's not going to happen, I'd rather be dead.
So the Bible teaches us that we need to love people, not things. We must love people and use things. Don't use people and love things. And that's what we see with Jonah. Jonah loved things more than people, and God showed him that. He loved a plant more than he loved a city of people. He was more willing to see a city of people destroyed than to see a plant destroyed. And so what God does to teach him an object lesson after he's made this complaint is he allows this plant to grow, which gives him shade. It appears it was very hot and he takes relief in the shade, but then a worm destroys this plant and Jonah is distraught. Not upset that, you know, a city was going to be destroyed, but he was upset because the plant that gave him shade died. And God says to him, you feel sorry about the plant, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? God was showing him to love people, not things. He had no love for people, but he loved a plant more than them. And so the last days that we live in, we are told, are also loved, uh, marked by people who love things more than God. They love self, they love money, they love pleasure. That's what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. That's the thing. Not lovers of the good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What's sad about that is that it's not just the world that we see that in. We see all three of those things as doctrines that are taught from pulpits. And so the love of money, we have the prosperity gospel where Christians are taught that you must love money. We have programs that are targeted at men's love of pleasure. And that's why we've got the seeker sensitive churches trying to entertain people because they will love pleasure more than they love God and lovers of themselves. And that's why we have the self-esteem gospel that tells you that the biggest problem you've got is your low self-esteem and you need to love yourself more. Although the Bible never instructs you to love yourself. It says love God and love your neighbor. And so those who propagate self-love even if they claim to be Christians, distance themselves from the true gospel. John says in one of his epistles, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, self-esteem, will have nothing to do with us. Wasn't interested in the true gospel because he loved to be first. And so we are told, do not love the world. Now, when it speaks about the world, it's not talking about the earth and loving nature and loving the mountains and the ocean. It's talking about the world system. So in 1 John 2 verse 15, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's the materialistic world. We are told that we must not love falsehood. Revelation 22, and it speaks about the occupants of the new Jerusalem. It says, outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts. It goes on to say, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So we must not love falsehood. What must we love? Or who must we love? Well, Jesus told us the two greatest things. He didn't say, you know, love money with all your heart, love yourself with all your heart, love pleasure. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And the second and greatest um, uh, commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are things you can love. We are told as husbands that you need to love our wives and do not be harsh with them. And we are told as women to love your husband and love your children. Good things to love. You're told to love your spiritual leaders. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Nothing wrong with loving your spiritual leaders. We are told to love foreigners. That's a good thing for some South Africans to hear. 
Um, Deuteronomy 10 verse 19 says, you are to love those who are foreigners for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. You can love your servants, your employees, depending on what situation you're in. Most of us have some um, situation where we have people who work for us, employed by us. Job says in Job 31, if I've denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? Quite insightful for a book that is considered to be the oldest book in the Bible. Already shown that Job realized he was no different in the eyes of God than his servants. We are told to love strangers. In fact, the word that we translate as hospitality in the English Bible, the Greek word philoxenia, actually literally in the Greek means love to strangers. Philoxenia. As in here, that's where we get our xenophobia from. That's the bad one. That's when people hate or afraid of strangers. Okay. Philoxenia, hospitality, love to strangers. And in the context of being told to let brotherly love continue in Hebrews 13, the practical example that is immediately followed is to be hospitable. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality, love to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And so the Bible presents love as the chief of virtues. You can aspire to, but love is the chief one. In fact, Jesus said that that's a mark of his disciple. He tells his disciples, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Not if you perform great miracles, or you, um, you know, have a very nice suit and fancy shoes and you know, the most expensive watch, if you love one another. J.C. Ryle says, let us note that our Lord does not name gifts or miracles or intellectual attainments as the evidence of discipleship, but love. The simple grace of love, a grace within reach of the poorest, lowliest believer as the evidence of discipleship. If we have no love, we have no grace, no regeneration, no true Christianity. So love is the chief of virtues. Galatians 5 verse 6 says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Colossians 3.14 says, over all these virtues, put on love. So all the other virtues we aspire to, well, over all of those, we're told to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity, the chief of virtues. 1 Corinthians 16.14, do everything in love. And 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 says, love never fails. It's very well known chapter from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels in other words if I'm able to exercise spiritual gifts but have not love I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal Paul's just been talking about the spiritual gifts and he says even if you have those gifts but you don't have love you're just making a noise if I have the gift of prophecy which he says is a gift that we need to seek after and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, so um, you're someone who gives away everything and even is a martyr and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And he says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. One day there will be no more need for prophecy. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. We one day will have no need for the spiritual gifts. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. 
So we've seen God's love for us and our response as we sing is that we love too. We love Jesus because he first loved us, but we also love others because of the love of Jesus. And so we are told that as the chief of virtues, we must pursue love. You man of God, Paul says to Timothy, pursue, he doesn't say pursue riches, pursue knowledge. He says pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. 2 Timothy 2.22, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And we are told that our love must be without limit. Romans 13 verse 8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Bible tells us that true love forgives. Not only forgives, it forgets. Just as God forgets our sins and he's moved them as far as the east is from the west. We are told in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't say, but remember, you know, so many years ago you did this and you did that. 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love overlooks faults. Proverbs 79 says, he who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. We see that love is generous. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 to 11. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. So the sincerity of their love was tested by how they gave, by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich, spiritually rich. And so, as Jesus said in John 3.16, love is giving God so love, that he gave. 1 John 3, 16 to 17 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? John showing we need to be practical. It's not just good enough to say, I love you. We need to do something where we can. Alexander Strauch says, Christian love is never theoretical or abstract. It is always practical. Augustine, the great North African church father from the 5th century, says, what does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has the eyes to see misery and want. It has the ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. So love can be seen. It's tangible in our actions. Love is unselfish, not self-seeking. Selfishness seeks to, or seeks its own private happiness at the expense of others. Love seeks its happiness in the happiness of the beloved. This is what John Piper said. It will even suffer and die for the beloved in order that its joy might be full in the life and purity of the beloved. So love puts others first. We used to have a song we sang in Sunday school. J-O-Y, J-O-Y, surely that must mean Jesus first, yourself last, others in between. If you want joy, you put Jesus first, then others. Love the Lord your God. Then love your neighbor, and then you can love yourself a bit after that. You probably already do. Okay, Romans 12, verse 9 to 10. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. 
Philippians 2, verse 2 to 4, we see that Paul uses Jesus as an example of that type of love that puts others first. He considered others' interests above the interests of themselves. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Because love puts others first, love considers the weak conscience of others, so it doesn't flaunt the liberty that you have in Christ and in order to stumble someone deliberately. Paul said that if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died, speaking about the issue they had in terms of eating food sacrificed to idols. He said, even if you don't believe it's wrong, don't deliberately do it in front of someone who does believe it and destroy someone by your knowledge. And so he says in a similar vein, 1 Corinthians 8, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. Because it puts others first, love is willing to serve. And so Galatians 5 verse 13 says, My brothers, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather serve one another in love. And that's why when Jesus did this act of uh, serving, it says that he was motivated by love. That's what it says. John 13 verse 1 says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And what did he do? He washed their feet. Love is hospitable, as we saw, the love of strangers. Alexander Strach again writes, hospitality fleshes out love in a uniquely personal and sacrificial way. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share our most prized possessions. We share our family, home, finances, food, privacy, and time. Indeed, we share our very lives. So hospitality is always costly. Through the ministry of hospitality, we provide friendship, acceptance, fellowship, refreshment, comfort, and love in one of the richest and deepest ways possible for humans to understand. Unless we open the doors of our homes to one another, the reality of the local church as a close-knit family of loving brothers and sisters is only a theory. Love is humble, patient, gentle. Ephesians 4, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, not having a short fuse. Making ev make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Be peacemakers. Strive to keep unity. Colossians 2 verse 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Then we are told that love does no harm. And that is why it's the fulfillment of the law, of those commandments which tell us not to commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, all of those you do harm to your neighbor. Do not cover, covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because love does no harm to its neighbor, Paul says. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm. So if you love your neighbor, you automatically fulfill the law by not stealing from them or committing adultery with their wife or murdering them. And so love is enduring. It doesn't disappear in difficult times. Proverbs 17 verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. It believes the best. Sometimes we're so quick to believe the worst about others. When we hear something, we immediately assume something bad is true without checking. But 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 says, love always protects. If you don't have all the facts, protect. 
It always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And so we see in the case of, of Noah in Genesis 9, where after the flood, um, he got drunk. And we see that his son Ham exposed his nakedness and ridiculed him. He thought it was a joke, called his brothers to come see their dad, um, who was naked. And in contrast, we are told that Shem and Ham wouldn't even look on their father's nakedness. They walked in backwards and they covered him. And how often do we try to expose others' nakedness? Rather than like uh, Shem and Japheth to try to cover their nakedness, we rather look at them and ridicule them. We try to expose each other's nakedness, their weaknesses or sin. So Galatians 6 verse 1 says, if someone is caught in a sin, you who, are, who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. That's what love does. It believes the best. Amy Carmichael, great missionary to India, um, wrote this to some of her closest co-workers. She said, we are trusted to spread the spirit of love, tenderness in judgment, the habit of thinking the best of one another, unwillingness to believe evil, Grief if we are forced to do so. Eagerness to believe good. Joy over one recovered from any slip or fall. Unselfish gladness in another's joys. Sorrow in another's sorrow. Readiness to do anything to help another entirely irrespective of self. All this and much more is included in that wonderful word, love. And she goes on to say to her co-workers, if love weakens among us, if it ever becomes possible to tolerate the least shadow of an unloving thought, our fellowship will begin to perish. Unlove is deadly. It is a cancer. It may kill slowly, but it always kills in the end. Let us fear it. Fear to give room to it, as we should fear to nurse a cobra. It is deadlier than any cobra. And just as one minute drop of the almost invisible cobra venom spreads swiftly all over the body of one into whom it has been injected, so one drop of the gall of unlove in my heart or yours, however unseen, has a terrible power of spreading all through our family. For we are one body, we are parts of one another. If one member suffers loss, all suffer loss. And so what is the gauge of love? In the engine room, in a steamship, it's impossible to look into the great boiler and see how much water it contains. But running up beside it, there's a tiny glass tube which serves as a gauge. When the tube is half full, the boiler is half full. So you don't have to look inside the boiler. You look at the gauge. It is a gauge. Do you ask, how do I know I love God? Look at the gauge. And what is the gauge? The Bible says that your love for your brother is the gauge of your love for God. That's what John says. That's the gauge. You say, I love God, but hate your brother. John says, you're a liar. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. John doesn't pull his punches. He says, anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So John says, that's the gauge. It's easy to say, you love God. 1 John 4 verse 21, it says, he's given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's a command. And our love for God is shown by how we treat his children. When Peter is uh, when Peter's restored by Jesus three times, Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? I know that he uses some different variations of the word there, but I'm not going to go into that. But the point is, he's asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter keeps saying, you know I love you. I do love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. That's how you prove that you love me. Feed my lambs. How do you treat God's children? Loving one another is a sign of a true Christian. So John says in 1 John 2, 9 to 11, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother 
he's still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. So John makes it quite clear. If you say, I love God, and yet you hate your brother, you're a liar. You're still in darkness. 1 John 4, 7 to 8. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. It's the chief attribute of God. True Christian will obey Jesus' commands. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. John 14, 23 to 24, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. And what is his teaching? What is his command? 1 John 5, verse 3, this is love for God to obey his commands. And his command is to love one another as I have loved you. 2 John 1, verse 6, I ask that we love one another. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So the gauge of love. Tertullian, in his defense of Christianity, and um, he was writing sometime in the late second century, noted how the pagans saw the love of the Christians. It was something that attracted them to Christianity. He said, it is our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say, he says, this is what the pagans say, look how they love one another. They themselves being given over to mutual hatred. Look how they are prepared to die for one another. They themselves, he says, been ready to kill each other. Thus had this saying become a fact, Tertullian says, hereby shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. That's the mark of a disciple. He said, even the pagans said, look how they love one another. Because hatred embodies the spirit of Cain. Remember Cain? hated his brother because his brother was more righteous than him. And 1 John 3 verse 11 to 15 says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone, John says, who does not love remains in death. So John says, you're a liar, you're walking in darkness, and you remain in death if you say, I love God and hate your brother. And then he says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. You're not even saved. C.S. Lewis, that great Oxford professor, former atheist who converted to Christianity, one of the books that he wrote is called The Four Loves. And he took its name from the four Koine Greek words for love that roughly equate to the following in English. So we could equate them to romance, affection, charity, and friendship. One of the loves is eros. And that's a romantic or erotic. That's where we get the word from, erotic, from eros. It's based on love because there's a physical sexual attraction. You love someone because you're attracted to them. Storge is fondness through familiarity, especially between family members. So the type of love that exists between a parent and a child is storge. Then charity, it's rendered in some of the older versions. Uh, the Greek word there is agapai. And that is love, the highest form of love, the love of God, which expects nothing in return. The love that loves the undeserving. It cares regardless of the circumstance and is the greatest love, as it is the love that God demonstrate, demonstrated to sinful men. 
and then there is filia. Filia is the friendship love that exists between people who share common interests. Uh, so for example, David and Jonathan, they loved one another. It was the filia type of love. And in fact, uh, the English word Philadelphia, uh, in the Greek it's uh, philia delphia, refers to brotherly love. So I want to talk just about that. We understand the agape, the fact that God loves the undeserving, and often that is our attitude. Well, I you know, love my brother, I love other Christians, but I love them, you know, even though they don't deserve it. But we're actually told to have brotherly love. Philia, Philadelphia. So you're not told just to tolerate other Christians. In other words, you must love um, with the friendship type of love as well. Not just because you tolerate them. Because you know that God loves them, so I better just put up with them. And so we find that there's some professing Christians who even use that as an excuse to not fellowship. They say, well, I love God, but I don't like his children. And uh, as you pointed out before, that's not considered to be a compliment if you tell someone I like you, but I don't like your kids. They wouldn't say, oh, well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. They'd probably get very offended. And yet some people do that. I love you, God, but I don't like your children. We instructed to have both kinds of love. And yeah, we can see 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 9. If you look at the Greek, now concerning brotherly love, that's the word that we get there, Philadelphia. You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love, and that's the word that's derived from agape, one another. We're supposed to have both. 1 Peter 1.22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love. That's why it renders it as brotherly love, because it's from Philadelphia. But then it also says love from agape, one another, earnestly from a pure heart. You need to have both. Keep on loving one another, one another, we are told in Hebrews 13, verse 1, as brothers, Philadelphia. 1 Peter 3, 8, verse 9, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And so, do you want to be effective and productive for God? Well, 2 Peter 1 verse 5 to 9 says this, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. These are all good things. And to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. Okay, brotherly love, Philadelphia. And to brotherly kindness, Love, which is the agape form of love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to be ineffective. You don't want to be unproductive. Well, there's a list of things that you need to aspire to. Two of them are brotherly love and the love of God, the agape love. And it says, if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. He's forgotten that you were once a sinner too. Storge is uh, the Greek word for, as I said earlier, the affection, the love that exists between family members, typically parents and children, and between siblings. Uh, it occurs once in Romans 12 verse 10. And... Um, so Romans 12, verse 10, when it says, be devoted, you can see that that word there is derived from storge to one another. So we're even told to have family affection because as Christians, we're a family as well. Brotherly love, Philadelphia, give preference to one another in honor. And it's rendered in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, show family affection. So that is giving the essence of the word. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. It's literally what that means. So that's not a bad paraphrase there. Outdo one another in showing honor. And so we are instructed to love one another with agape, Philadelphia, and storge love. Okay, love 
of undeserving type of love. Love one another as brothers and sisters and the family bond as well. Um, the friendship, sorry, Philadelphia is the friendship and Storga is the family love. So you don't just tolerate one another out of a higher sense of God-like love. You should have a general, uh, genuine brotherly friendship and affection, the family affection. And so there's a similar thought expressed in 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 2. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So we see this family affection. What is the result of love? Love changes people. Uh, James and John. Jesus had a nickname for them. He called them Boanerges, the sons of thunder, because these were rough and ready fishermen, very zealous for the Lord. And at one stage when there was a town that didn't want to let Jesus through, they said to Jesus, do you want us to come on fire to come down from heaven and consume them? The sons of thunder. And Jesus said, you do not know what kind of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, if you notice, a lot of the things we've been reading have come from John's Gospel and the epistles of John. And this was a man who was once a son of thunder who wanted to call, like Jonah, wanted a city to be destroyed just because they didn't want to let them, you know, have passage through it. And yet this became a man who was known as the apostle of love. Love changes people. In a commentary on Galatians 6 verse 10, Jerome, Jerome was the, um, the Latin church father who translated the Bible into Latin in the uh, late 4th, 35th century. And he tells a famous story about John. He's an extreme old age at Ephesus because John spent the, you know, the last years of his life at Ephesus. Um, Jerome relates that John had eventually to be carried into the congregation by his disciples. He was so frail and would say nothing except little children love one another. At last, wearied that he always spoke the same words, they asked the master, why do you always say this? He replied, because it is the Lord's command. And if this only is done, it is enough. What was John referring to? Why did John keep telling people that even in his old age? Because he remembered, as he recorded in his gospel, that Jesus had said to them at the Last Supper, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And we know that Jesus that same day proceeded to show his love, not just by washing their feet, but by going to the cross. And John knew that Jesus said, that's how you need to love one another as I have loved you. And so our love, is prompted by God's love. 1 John 4 verse 19, we love because he first loved us. According to the world, we love in order to be loved. But according to the word of God, we love because God first loved us. Whereas the world falls in love, God's people are established in love. The love that we possess However, it is not a fleeting whim that comes and goes with every mood and circumstance. Rather, it is a love that is beyond ourselves. Our love, true love, has meaning. Meaning that cannot be stripped away by anything, anyone or any feeling. Our love cannot be shaken because it is grounded not in self but in sacrifice. That's what Burke Parsons says. But our love for one another is also prompted by Jesus' love for us. Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 2 says that we need to be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It was a giving love as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How did Jesus show his love for us? Well, Jesus explained our love is demonstrated. He said to his disciples in John 15, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. 
I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I've loved you. And then he says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, which as I said is what he proceeded to do later that very same day. Sacrificial, giving love. And so if you love, you embody the very nature of God because God is love. 1 John 4, again, the apostle of love, the former son of thunder, become apostle of love, says this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So if you love, you embody the very nature of God. If you love one another, God lives in you and his love is made complete in you. And in that context, he goes on to say, then we'll have no fear of God's judgment. Now, people, like so many scriptures, quote this out of con uh, uh, context. You have people say, perfect love drives out all fear. So you mustn't be fearful, um, you know, if you have perfect love. In the context, it's talking about fear of judgment, not about, you know, other sorts of fears that you may have. So what has he said? He said, you need to love one another. Because of that, you embody the nature of God. And he says, then... You won't have got a fear, a fear of God's judgment. Why? Because he says you're like God. How will God judge you if you like him? That's what he's saying. He goes on to say, whoever lives in love, lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. He says, then, if you're living in love, you can be confident about the judgment. Why? Because in the world, we are like him. We're like God. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So the context of that is the fear that's driven out is the fear of judgment. You don't have, have to have fear of judgment. You can have confidence of the day of judgment. Why? Because you love. And because you're loving, you have the very nature of God. So why would God judge you if you have his nature? And so he says the one who fears, if you have a fear of God's judgment, he said you're not made perfect in love. Because... Perfect love drives out fear of judgment. And then he goes on to say as well that that gives you the assurance of salvation. If we have confidence that, uh, that when we stand before God, uh, we have nothing to fear, he says, well, that gives you your assurance. He says, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. So he says that your heart will sometimes condemn you, but he says you can set your heart at rest in his presence if we love. No fear of judgment, assurance of salvation. We know that that also comes through the, the promised Holy Spirit. But John says you can set your heart at rest by reminding yourself that you love and you have the very nature of God living inside you. And so do you love like this? And this is how Paul defines love as we draw to a conclusion. 1 Corinthians 13, this is part of his definition, but is this the kind of love you have for oh, your brothers and sisters? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Is that the love that you have? You might say, well, if I love like that, I might get hurt, make myself vulnerable. And so again, I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis from The Four Loves, and this is my concluding slide. 
Will you get hurt if you love that way? Well, C.S. Lewis says you will. He said to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, soft, a safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. Impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. And that's the love that we have, not only for God, but for one another.